Greetings, Starfighters. Welcome to a new tier ranking video that is actually the sixth anniversary, um, I guess you can call it a special for Shameless Cash Grab. Um, a lot of stuff's been going on on the home front that and I, I don't actually really want to get into right now. I mean, I don't think I'm explicitly not allowed to. It's just uncomfortable to talk about at the moment. But, uh, yeah, for that reason, there was just not really much of a chance that the Season 9 premiere was going to be making it to uh, February 5th, I believe the, uni the anniversary is. It's going to come out in February, just later in February. Well, I should say later this month. I'm recording this at the end of January. But, uh, anyway, tier ranking list. The best in set films of season one through seasons one through eight of Shameless Cash Grab. And, yeah, I made this one myself. Because, let's face it, I doubt there are that many people in the world who have seen all eight of these movies. Anywho, uh... It's not a traditional tier ranking video, as we're not going to do the S, A, B, C, D thing here. I'm just going to rank these from 8 to 1, although that is kind of subject to... That's probably going to be subject to change. I often change my opinions on movies over the years, but... Let's go ahead and jump right into this, because... Um, well, relating to that home front stuff, I don't know if I, I might get called away at any moment... So, we'll start with uh, the bottom. Number eight. The worst of the best. And... Mm, it's really... It really did come down... I mean, people who've listened to the show for a long time or probably figured it was going to be either The Killing Machine or The Last Christmas Home. And it is just barely The Killing Machine at number eight. Uh... It's competently made. It's definitely good that Dolph Lundgren didn't try to pretend he was younger than he actually was in it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't have much in the way of negative things to say about it. Well, okay, now there is like the one non-white character getting rather unceremoniously killed off. That kind of sucks. Which I think that might be... Okay, yeah, now that I'm saying it out loud, that is definitely why it goes into number eight instead of to number seven. But yeah, it's it's a solid action movie, and if you like Dolph Lundgren, you'll like this. Even if it does contain, as I joked in the episode at the time, one of the worst simulated oral sex scenes outside of movies that I've seen Diamanda Hagen review. So, number seven comes from season eight, and that is The Last Christmas Home. Again, probably a good sign for a movie that the worst thing you can say... Well, okay, let me let me start that over. The worst thing you can say about the romantic male lead in a Hallmark Channel Christmas movie is that his haircut is incredibly distracting. <laughs> and, uh... Yeah, there were, there were definitely complaints I had about it. You probably remember some of them since we're not that far out from the Season 8 wrap-up episode. But most of them are relatively minor, especially compared to other episode, other episodes from that season, or fuck, like ninety percent of the previous season. Sweet Jesus! But uh, don't get me started on Paul Matthews again. But you know, it's 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 fine. It's fine. It it manages to be better than the Killing Machine, largely through not having any death scenes that feel unnecessarily cruel. <laughs> but other than that, I'd actually put them on about the same level if we were doing this the traditional tier ranking way. Let's see, uh, number six. Um, yeah, with number six, we are going to go with... Yeah, we'll go with season seven's best movie. I, I do. I really think. I, I'm confident that I genuinely liked this movie, and I would have enjoyed it seeing it in isolation and not as the last movie in what currently stands as the worst season of the show. But maybe I'm like, maybe I am grading it on a curve just on subconsciously, but it, I mean, it is fun. 
it does have some issues. The child actors are not always great. In fact, it is kind of amusing to me that it's actually the youngest one of the main three who's the best actor. But I've often said I try to go easier on child actors in general because the truly great ones are rare. And so, honestly, if you get one who's just merely competent, thank your lucky stars and don't be mean to them. I'm looking at people like you, Nostalgia Critic. <laughs> just, But yeah, you know, you had a villain with a great voice and uh, and his plan was menacing enough and it was it some like decent, subtle social commentary going on there. And I, I thought the how they solved the ending was pretty clever. It it certainly has some holes in it that I think if if those like kind of plot problems I had that I talked about in the episode had been plugged, I might actually put it up a little even a little higher than what's going to go into number five. But yeah, the Secret Kingdom I I enjoyed it at least. Number five, um, hmm. I'm going to go with... Okay, this is going to be really close here between Season 5's best and Season 6's best, uh, and I think what the tiebreaker is is that they're, they're both good, obviously. I wouldn't have put each of them at number one of those seasons if that weren't the case. <laughs> And the fact they're both making the top five here out of eight. But I think the tiebreaker for me is the fact that Mississippi River Sharks is funnier. It got more laughs. I mean, Grand Lady, Lady Gangster isn't necessarily a comedy. Though, I mean, it has funny moments, but it wasn't really trying to be a comedy. And admittedly, this is all arbitrary anyway. So I'll go ahead and put Lady Gangster at number five. I think there was a little bit in the ending I didn't particularly care for, but that was also kind of normal for the era when that movie was made. But there were, you know, the, the characters were interesting, the pacing was fine, the acting was solid, you know. And it actually had a happy ending, which I didn't really expect from a movie from that era, like where the Hayes Code was in full swing. Because, I mean, the... the title character does do some pretty shady stuff. I mean, nothing particularly evil, but, you know, not necessarily nice. So the fact that she gets to, you know, she gets to go free and gets the guy, that's... That would probably be normal for a movie today, but for the 1940s, that's actually pretty impressive. So, uh, above Lady Gangster, I'm going to put Mississippi River Sharks... This is the movie that Sharknado thinks it is. It's it's a self-referential parody, but that doesn't feel like it's being insulting to the genre it's parodying, which would be a really easy thing to do, considering, well, let's face it, the bulk of that genre, or I should say the subgenre of shark movies made specifically for the sci-fi channel, or maybe just, say, sci shark movies made for basic cable in general, um, yeah, but it, it's it's funny. It's it's funnier if you've seen a bunch of those other movies before you've seen this one. But you know, it it doesn't it it's not mean to any of its characters. Not even the ones who die. <laughs> you know, um, and it doesn't try to pretend it's anything more than what it is. And I mean, Jason London, the the, the bit with having. Jason London be replaced by Jeremy London in the in the franchise and, and he's playing himself but an exaggerated version of himself that it's it's funny. It's a fun little movie. But although I imagine if you watch it by itself without having seen any of the movies in the subgenre it's kind of poking fun at, you might not enjoy it as much. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that out there. Number three. Um there's one massive bit of cringe towards the end of this movie that keeps it out of the number two spot. That keeps it out of the top two. I do still think it's a really good movie. I think it's a highlight for a lot of the people involved, particularly. I mean, this is you can you can kind of start to see the genesis of you know villains that 
Mark Hamill would go on to play later, like, you know, the trickster on the Flash, both versions of the Flash and the Joker. But yeah, God, that forced kiss with Bill Paxton and I, I don't know the actress's name off the top of my head, but that was kind of... Could have lived without that, but, you know, you had a solid supporting cast and some beautiful, beautiful visuals. I think maybe they could have done a better job of explaining uh, how the whole slipstream thing works. Because I think something I've noticed that some critics of the movie seem to have missed, but that I picked up on, it's that the deal with the slipstream is air travel is really only po possible along, like, those lines. If you try to go outside of it at all, the winds are just going to tear you apart. And that's why they can only use, like, small, really maneuverable craft. Because something that's large and needs a wide turn radius, like a passenger line or whatever, is not going to have a chance. Neither would a fighter jet, because it's small enough, but it also goes way too fast. So you'd need something that's small, relatively slow, or at least as slow as, you know, like, propeller-powered aircraft go, and maneuverable. And... That obviously has a big effect on society there. I think maybe a little too big, all things considered, but, you know, this was a movie. I imagine a novel would do a lot more with that. But, I mean, I liked it, obviously. it was the It's the first number one of the entire show. So, but, yeah. Okay, number two. This movie is just, it is fun in the dumbest way but, again, much like with Mississippi River Sharks, it doesn't really pretend to be anything other than what it is. And I always appreciate it when a movie does that. I mean, not that I'm against ambition, mind you. I like Southland Tales, and that movie is one where the writer-director's reach clearly exceeded his grasp. But um, Hard Ticket to Hawaii is just pure, dumb fun it doesn't take itself too seriously at all but it also doesn't like try to do that kind of nod in the wink it's like huh, isn't this stupid it's just like it's like yeah this is stupid but we're going with it and you know again that's a, that's a plus and the action scenes are just ludicrously over the top and the, a lot of and the jokes I gotta, I gotta hand it to Andy Sedaris. A lot of the jokes just genuinely land. Uh, the later movies, because there were like three of these, three Andy Sedaris movies on the second season too, and this is hands down the best one. But his later ones, the jokes didn't work quite as often. But this one, it definitely did. And it's a great action comedy, and... Um, I won't go so far as to say it's like good good, but... The, the this movie turns up frequently on like you know top ten, top five, top eight, top one hundred, whatever. So bad it's good movies. I don't think anyone's ever done a top one hundred, but yeah, get on that AFI. <laughs> yeah, one hundred years of cheese. Any, anyway, yeah, it, it's it, it it's definitely earned its place on there more so than some other movies that get the so bad it's good label that to my opinion, are actually just straight up bad. But yeah, if you like action, you like comedy, you like cheese, Hard Ticket to Hawaii is a great watch, and that's why I have no problem putting it ab above Slipstream. I mean, granted, neither movie is excels in the respecting women department, but at least with Hard Ticket to Hawaii, it's a lot more honest about it. <laughs> it but yeah, that just leaves us with one more, and I imagine a lot of you probably saw this one coming, but yeah. Vincent Price, Last Man on Earth, iconic horror film, some of the best acting of his entire career, influential, pretty well-paced. Just, I mean, what else really is there to say about it that I didn't say in the episode itself? And that um, Mom and Robin said in uh, the second opinions episode about it <laughs> so yeah here we are and sorry if this all seems a little short but again i was only working with eight movies eight movies that i've talked about before and there's there was always the very very real chance that i was going to get called away at any moment so just to do a quick recap before we close out this episode which 
hopefully has gone up on the channel on the sixth anniversary of Shameless Cash Grab. Number eight, The Killing Machine. Number seven, The Last Christmas Home. Number six, The Secret Kingdom. Number five, Lady Gangster. Number four, Mississippi River Sharks. Number three, Slipstream. Number two, Hard Ticket to Hawaii. And number one, The Last Man on Earth. And since I forgot to say this at the end of the Season 8 wrap-up episode, I'll go ahead and say it here, although I don't usually do it on tier ranking videos, or at least I don't think I do. It's been several months since I've done one of these. Have fun. Stay safe.